Okay, great. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Apologies for the uh, delay. Um, this is a uh, happy occasion uh, for uh, several reasons. The first one, of course, is the simple fact that we are here assembled in person. We may not be plentiful, but uh, treasure the idea of being together with other people, not a faceless Zoom, although we do welcome all our, uh, our Zoom uh, participants. Nothing against that, of course, but it is nice for the few of us who have the opportunity to be here in person. And another reason this is a, a happy occasion is it, I feel like we're uh, inviting an old friend uh, who's, who's never uh, spoken to us before, but Bart has been a member of the Department of Public Policy, which as some of you know, no longer exists. It's now part of the bigger and better Department of uh, Public and International Affairs. And uh, Bart, in his capacity in the former department, the new department has been working for a number of years on uh, Southeast Asia related topics. We finally uh, had the opportunity to, to invite him over to, to uh, do a CERC seminar. So thank you very much, uh, Bart. Let me just give you a little background. Uh, Bart has, um, as I said, been at the City University for some time, almost 17, 12. 12 years, we've been here the same time. Um, and <laughs> and uh, he is a uh, professor of urban studies and urban policy. And his research has focused on issues relating to urban governance and social justice, uh, but re more recently with the focus on cultural common. With Lara von Materen, uh, he has a research-based practice that interrogates the social role of art and independent contemporary art organizing in East and Southeast Asia. And together they created the coming soon, uh, the, well, this is in the past, the, the biennial. Yeah. Right, so, so that was created by them in the context for the 2020 Bangkok Biennial with uh, some Thai organizers uh, working also with the Inappropriate Book Club. Those uh, uh, sentences should indicate to you that Bart is shall we say, somewhat unconventional in his approach in recent years, uh, bringing his expertise in uh, his policy-oriented field to, to the field of art. And it also is uh, nice um, for us in the center who have always uh, had a uh, soft spot for cultural issues, which we've tended to neglect, being more of a uh, policy, uh, uh, politics and sociology-oriented center. Uh, but we're very pleased indeed, uh, Bart, that you had the time to join us today. We look forward to your talk. And as usual, uh, afterwards, there'll be time for discussion. We'll also be taking uh, questions from those who are joining us uh, via internet. Again, welcome to all of you uh, who are joining us that way. So again, thanks for coming, Bart. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. So I don't have to tell who I am myself, it's easier. Um, thanks for coming, everybody, and also thanks for having me here. Uh, it's true that I've been around for a long time, but it's still good to formally engage. Um, just a couple of things about my own background so that you understand. So I started off with research, urban research, right? I've got, got an urban planning, uh, public management background. And a lot of the research was about social justice and the city issues. And it focused a lot of different cities in Asia, including a lot of projects in Bangkok. And uh, more recently, I started to focus as part of those projects also on, the, on contemporary art and how contemporary art functions in cities and the potential of contemporary art. On the one hand, maybe to, to push back against forms of domination, but on the other hand, also but to be appropriated by those forms of domination. Uh, that work is a lot of co-authored work and co-research work with, with Lara van Metre and then a lot of other uh, friends by now and also colleagues, uh, especially in Thailand, but also in other cities in Asia. Um, can you guys hear me online? That's the only question. So, um, the, as part of those projects, um, at some point I have, I had a growing feeling that maybe the, the, the core task, according to our university, namely publishing articles in SCI journals, wasn't maybe the only really important thing to do. And uh, of course, without neglecting that task, I, um, together with a couple of other friends, I felt that maybe it's much more important to also 
um, work on engagement with what happens in Thailand around contemporary art. So we set up this uh, this, uh, this collective network called the Inappropriate Book Club, which is a network that reflects on art and politics, but then tries to take discussions of that out of the out of the university and tries to organize them within the city. And, and it has all sorts of projects that engage with translated text, but then in different forms. So one of the examples, if anybody here wants to take or reads Thai, uh, this is one of the books that we made, uh, which then forms the basis for uh, engagement meetings where we very often invite the authors and then discuss. Uh, we have a new space now in Bangkok where we will have two weekly uh, discussion meetings also based on text and, and participants can themselves bring forward text that we will discuss. So that's part of the work I do. But here I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, a, a, a relatively small research project for contemporary art biennials nationally in Thailand. And the reason why it has a subtitle notes from a laboratory is because at once in 2018, there were a load of these biennials organized and it's by very different uh, groups of people in very different formats, so it's very interesting to use that as a way of looking what happens with those biennials and with the outcomes if you look at these different, different formats of organization. Um, so how am I going to talk about this? Yeah. So th this, I, I, I told you this is a relatively small project. Uh, it's, it's one of many that we're doing, which actually all come together in a larger overall project. And I want to say something about that larger project so that you understand why I asked the questions that I did. And that, that large project focuses on psycho, what is called psychopolitics and contemporary art. And psychopolitics, as I will explain, is a term that comes from uh, Byung Cho Ha. Uh, secondly, I will look at Thailand as a location very shortly within that discussion. And then I will move on to, to look at 2018 biennials. First, I will make some general remarks about biennials. Then I will have to say something about visions about contemporary art that play a role in Thai society before focusing on these three biennials that I look at Bangkok Art Biennale, uh, the Thailand Biennale, and the Bangkok Biennial before coming to sort of an initial interpretation. And I said that the larger project is really still work in progress, so I won't get very deep in that. So, any suggestions that you guys would have would be very helpful. So, first, psychopolitics and contemporary art. Um, obviously, I, you can talk really long about that, but I just want to make a couple of remarks out here. So uh, this, this is a quote from uh, Byung Chua Han's uh, relatively uh, small thin book, Psychopolitics, which at the moment is free to download from the Perso book website. So if you're interested in it, you can get it for free. And in this quote, he says that neoliberal regimes, the neoliberal regime's technology power takes on subtle uh, supple and smart forms, thereby it escapes visibility in as much as it expands, expends a great deal of energy to force people into a straitjacket of commandments and prohibitions, this binary power proves inefficient. A significantly more efficient technology power makes sure that people subordinate themselves to power relations on their own. Now in this quote, it's, it starts with talking about neoliberal regimes of power, and, and in the second part, it talks about uh, disciplinary power. Um, according to Han, these are different periods. Disciplinary power belongs to the period of the industrial society. We now live in, in the neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism and under neoliberal capitalism. The focus of power is not so much focused on restricting what you do and straight jacketing what you do and straight jacketing who you are. It's much more focused on trying to frame what you want to do. So according to Han, the power, especially is a positive power instead of the negative power of, of the, both in this, in the industrial society. So how does that work? Um, and this is based on work of Foucault, built on work of Foucault. Foucault looked at a lot of institutional domains that all were disciplining bodies, according to Foucault. So if you would look at medicine, if you would look at uh, mental health care, if you would look at sexuality, all the discourses about these institutions were about disciplining behavior. It was about restricting what people could do. Instead, according to Han, what happens under neoliberal uh, capitalism is that people are sort of enticed to want something uh, and then they want it themselves. So instead of being restricted to certain work hours where you can only be at the office and you have to do something, uh, workers have become free agents that themselves then 
have have a reason to develop themselves to get better at that. There's all these self help uh, groups, all these self help activities where you become a better professional. So if you look at the sort of power, basically at work under neoliberalism, according to Han, it's a positive power. It imagines things to do. Um, it's also a power that entices people to consume. These are things that, and, and this power works through effect. It works through setting images of yourself that are cheap aspirational. And by making it aspirational, people actually themselves want to submit to that power. So instead of people being exploited by others, as happened under disciplinary regimes, people are now exploiting themselves. Every hour of the day becomes a way to improve yourself, to become a better professional, to have a better output, to develop yourself. Also, when you look at your healthcare, it's, it's all about looking at all these metrics of who you are as a person and develop yourself as a person so that you become a better person, so that you do more products, so that you are more productive. And in the end, that contributes to capitalism. So instead of restricting people and exploiting them as others, people are now exploiting themselves. That's the analysis of Pyung Shul Han. And what he says, what is quite important, is that therein lies a particular intelligence defining the neoliberal uh, regime. No resistance to the system can emerge in the first place. So according to Pyung Shul Han, because this is self-control, this is power over the self that you choose yourself, you won't develop into even resisting it because you see it as freedom. You see it as, as, as furthering yourself. So you don't have a reason to actually escape that power. So he's very skeptical about all sorts of, of suggestions of how we can get out of a contemporary capitalism. Um, of course, way too short to do right to, to his whole framework, but I'll leave it to that. But of course, when everything is effect, uh, is, is all hope lost. And, and Byung Chul Han is actually very pessimist. He's a pessimist. Also, throughout his pages, it's not very optimistic what you read. He's saying, well, all these people that think that it can be changed are just mistaking themselves because people won't be willing to do it. So, for instance, Marx thought that, that automatically a capitalist system would create its own, uh, its, its own death. And then in the end, a socialist society would emerge. Well, Jung Chul Han says, no, that didn't happen. Actually, neoliberal society emerged where people are willing to control themselves. Um, However, there's other people that are more optimistic. Hart and Negri believe that we can actually escape capitalism if we step out and create our own practices in which we don't focus so much on capitalist production, but much more on socializing. And we can set our own rules. So they have an exodus strategy. Um, Nancy Fraser in, in a recent book, very strong book, Cannibal uh, Capitalism, pleads for the emergence of a broad counter-hegemonic social movement. And she thinks that that is possible. Uh, Fefek Chiber, similarly, in Confronted Capitalism, provides suggestions for dealing with neoliberal capitalism. And then Chantal Mouffe argues for a new left populism, uh, which has to work through a takeover of positions within all institutions. So these are all well-known writers that are actually still optimistic that it can be an, alter an alternative to neoliberal capitalism. Whoa, this is hard to read. <laughs> Uh, messing it up. Okay, um, so what about contemporary art then? Because I'm not looking at all these big stories, I'm looking at contemporary art in that setting. This is the background from which to look at contemporary art. Well, first of all, through its effective capacities, contemporary art is by excellence a practice of psychopolitics. Uh, it's contemporary art really works through enticing people to do things, uh, and thereby it can be a great tool for psychopolitics itself. So that's the first role that, that contemporary art can have, have in this setting of, uh, of, of uh, uh, neoliberal capitalism. Secondly, and in this context also, Botonsky stresses that, that this, this control of self doesn't only focus on the self, but actually neoliberal capitalism also works by adding value to objects. So a lot of contemporary art, what contemporary art can do is add value to objects. I'll say some more about that later, so I won't say too much about it now. Um, however, others still stress that the role of contemporary art as a practice for counter-hegemonic agency remains as well. So in contemporary art, you see this difference. On, one, on the one hand, it can be this tool for, for, for new forms of power, but on the other hand, it can also be a podium where this power is resisted. So what are these relations between these different 
roles, where the third kind of power that comes up for the RS. That's sort of the overall question of the virtual research project. And within that framework, we started to do a set of quite descriptive empirical studies, which I will present one of now. So if you look at Thailand within that discussion, because Gunther Hahn speaks generally about society. So what happens if you look at Thailand, if you zoom in at this specific location? So there is a couple of questions that comes forward when you do that. So the first question would be, uh, does Han pay sufficient attention to that first form of concurrent domination? So yes, there is capitalism in the way in which capitalism um, controls people or has an effect on people. But at the same time, there's other centers of power like, like the state. Uh, in the story of Han, the state seems remarkably absent unless it is the initial form of power that even preceded the capitalist society. But that seems a little bit funny. And when you look at a society like Thailand, that of course becomes a very big question. Secondly, does an analysis of transitions between subsequent forms of power make sense? Han acts like first there was sovereign power of sovereign kings, then there was the disciplinary power of the industrial society, and then there was the more positive power through effect of neoliberal, neoliberal capitalism. Does it really make sense to think of power in these subsequent ways? I mean, we know about these discussions of how in industrial society, obviously there's also agriculture, right? The, the earlier forms of organization don't disappear. Does it also not mean that earlier forms of power still exist? And if so, what are the relationship between these? So um, another question is, did an earlier state-centered strategies uh, not make use of effect also. So according to Han, he, he locates effect and positive power, power very st stringently within neoliberal capitalism. But before neoliberal capitalism, states have always been using, for instance, art to imagine certain images of the state and thereby to, to give positive ideas of what people in a society should be. Is it really that new or did that happen earlier already? And if so, what are the relationship between these things? Um, and and, and this, this is a well-known story for many, for many countries uh, where, where every time art is being used to imagine certain, certain ideas about the state and the nation. And the last thing would be then, uh, what, what is the status and the promise of counter-hegemonic common-oriented practices in that setting that also exist? So Han suggests that it doesn't have, have any, that it doesn't make sense to resist almost, or it won't work. But there is a lot of counter practices in, in Thai society. How do they function and what is the promise? So these are all sort of questions that you can ask based on, on the framework of Han. So with that, let's look at contemporary art biennials in Thailand, the topic of today. So um, first, of course, a question, if you look at contemporary art, why look at uh, art biennials? What's the importance of biennials? Because it's a very specific topic within the contemporary art practice. Well. Corinne and Kartner have written a whole book about this, and they say that these regularly recurring exhibitions have come since the early 1990s to define contemporary art. Many visitors encounter contemporary art solely within their frames. So what Gardner and Green say is that contemporary art, people that see contemporary art, they mainly see it at biennials. That is one of the prime locations where people engage with contemporary art. So it's a good spot to look at the mechanics of power at work uh, in contemporary art. Now, you guys, of course, have heard of biennials. Uh, everybody knows about the Venice Biennale, which is, let's say, the godfather or the godmother of all biennials. Uh, another very well-known biennial is Del Camento, which is organized every five year in Kassel and just closed the last edition. And you might have heard to a lot of uh, discussion uh, there's a lot of people in Germany very upset. Uh, there's also a lot of organizers that were involved with the biennial very upset. And it was a very clear uh, collapse between old world sensitivities and new world sensitivities, um, which, which I thought was very interesting. On a personal note, we were there also with the Inappropriate Book Club to present as part of one of the pavilions in uh, uh, Documenta. And for us, it was really interesting and nice because at the Documenta, uh, the model of the Documenta was to invite others to make choices about what is being showed. And many of these others we knew because they came from the Asian setting. So a lot of collectors that were invited, actually we knew. So for us, it was more of a social meeting point, uh, you could say, uh, than, than really an art show where you would look at artworks, which then 
actually is also the analysis of many critics of what this biennial is, that it's not so much about the art, but much more about meeting people. Uh, the organizers say that that actually was deliberate and that's a good thing. A lot of the art critics say that that's a bad thing because art is something more than just meeting people. So I think that's where some of the discussion is, is going on. So those are two well-known uh, biennials. Now th there's biennials everywhere, but now this is this is graphic uh, counting biennials over time. 2019, it went even further up. Uh, and uh, this is a map of where those biennials were. And this is already a little while ago. Um, while you can see that still the vast majority are in Europe, you can also see that actually it's, it's relatively spread out over the world. Uh, in, in Asia, there's 83 biennials now, in Australia, 10, uh, South America and Africa, less so. But given the growth of these biennials, it's pretty likely that also there this number will remain growing. Now, in Thailand itself, um, there have been both several projects that that fund that were yearly recurrent and i'm talking about biennials which of course is a two-year uh, project but you or or event but you perennial events could also be five-year ones like the documenta or three-year ones it could, it could be many things so in thailand there have been various uh, events functioning in a perennial like setting for instance uh, the chiang mai social installation which was a bottom-up organized event uh but but in the mid 2010s, when around the world there were a lot of uh, new biennials, there were actually no biennials being organized, hardly any. And then at once in 2018, there was the Bangkok Biennial, which was the first one to be organized, but that was announced in response to a couple of other announcements, namely of the Thailand Biennale, which is organized by the state. Uh, the Bangkok Biennial was bottom up organized by artists, and the Bangkok Art Biennale, which is organized by corporation. So these were three biennials. At once they were announced. And, and it's, it's, it seems pretty likely that especially the announcement of this Bangkok Art Biennale, which, which, was, uh, which was headed by Apinan, who is a well-known figure in the Thai art world, uh, that, that triggered others to respond and also organize biennials. So, and then there were actually a lot of others also. There, there was the Kung Ken Manifesto, there was Ghost 2561, which will be organized in, uh, Ghost will be organized in three weeks again in Bangkok. Uh, so, so, and, and this list go on. So at once there were like eight events that were like aiming to, to be recurrent. Uh, by now, they all have had at least two iterations. Now Ghost will have its second iteration. Now the Bangkok Biennial sort of have an event, uh, but not really very expanded. So when organizing, when analyzing these events, we need to keep in mind that there's different visions and different functions of, of art. And I just want to say a couple of remarks about that before I'm going to talk about the actual biennials. Now, first of all, you have to realize that that before there was contemporary art and, and modern art was, was the most recent form of art. Uh, at that time, the Thai state played an enormous role on, on the, fu the functioning of modern art in Thailand. And it's not for nothing that uh, the first art school in Thailand, uh, Silpacorn University, well, it, it wasn't called Silpacorn at the time, was founded in 1933, a year after. Um, um, and and as, as you could say a revolution that ended, sort of halfway ended absolute monarchy, or it, it at least changed a lot. And, and at that time, it was very unclear what it would result in. Uh, this art school was founded by uh, monarchists that wanted to, at, at a time when, when, when there was popular sovereignty, wanted to continue to control society. And, and this quote by David Tay says that pop, pop, popular sovereignty and newly mooted freedoms had to be sacrificed at the altars of national unity and progress. And in order to be imagined these ideals, the ideals of national unity and progress had to be imaged. And there was plenty of art to do. So the role of modern art became to image national unity and to image progress in a world where the monarchs, where, where the, the former representatives of the former hegemony were really worried that they were losing control. Um, so that resulted in a whole system in which Silicon University became very central. And, and if you wanted to be anything in, in, in modern art in Thailand, you needed to be a professor at the university or you needed to have studied with a professor at the university because they were the gatekeepers for almost everything. If you wanted to participate 
in an in an exhibition if you wanted to participate in uh, in 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 all sorts of things in, in in modern art you needed to go through them so this is called the silpercon system and a little bit later actually that was translated in the model of the national artist a, a model that you see much more in the in the southeast asian and east asian con uh, context where certain artists uh, artists got a position the position of national artist which came with a stipend that was enormous uh, uh, lifelong uh, money uh, housing and everything so uh, materially in, in the thai context hugely important but these national artists got prime position in any sort of board that would have to decide about anything including the artworks that commercial that corporate parties would buy so if you didn't know a national artist and the national artist didn't like you as an artist you wouldn't have any chance to function in thailand and through that of course these national artists got a a huge control over what modern art should be and that was imagining a correct way of being Thai it was all focused on Thai-ness and what did, what were good Thai culture and what were good Thai manners so this is then a, 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 this is a short clip from an interview with me guy in a very well-known uh, contemporary artist from uh, Chiang Mai from the north who himself uh, is, is from a minority descent, so hasn't ever felt very at home in, in, a, in this Thai uh, narrative. And this is what he says about uh, the functioning. Sound is not on. You have to read this. I think it's because it comes from my. I don't know how to fix that. So apologies about the sound. So what Mikya In says is that art has become a way of, of showing what is what is what are the good people. And with the good people, that's a very hierarchical way of saying the elites that know how you're supposed to behave and what and, and all Thai people should aspire to be that. And modern art had the function to actually share those visions, those images of what it means to be a good person, right? So that's pretty close to the way that affects or positive uh power works under neoliberalism it's not saying you can't be like that it's saying you should be like this it's inspiring people to be a certain way so again that's one position in in the in the functioning of contemporary art in thailand a very state-centered position which aligns with with dominant hegemony in thinking about how thailand should be and how it functions there have been two oppositions relatively recently one opposition has come uh, from bottom up with uh, in 1933 uh, the revolution at the time came from a group of people that felt that sovereignty shouldn't be located in the king up there but in the people and that's the way of, of thinking about the thai state that it should support diversity that it should look at if, that there are different thai people that all are important and that actually um, uh, administration should make uh, should take care of the fact that everybody has a decent life um, that that way of thinking in, in art and especially in the last 20 30 years when contemporary art started to be dominant um, got much more crowned uh, in, in Thailand because first of all Silvercorn University lost its control over art education there were many new art schools where, uh, where Thai got educated and a lot of Thai actually got education abroad and this brought new ideas about the role of art into Thailand that could also be used for imagining another Thailand than the Thailand of, of the state. Uh, with that, uh, in the early, late 1980s came all sorts of new art spaces where these ideas could be uh, presented as well. So that's the first opposition is this bottom up way of thinking about alternative ways of Thailand. The second opposition uh, came from the corporate world. The corporate world in the late 1980s started to realize that actually contemporary art can play an important role in consumerism. 
in, in imagining uh, aspirations for consumption. Um, uh, at that, there were a couple of big projects that these groups organized together with the state of imagining other Thailands. And corporations got the idea that this could work very well as well. They were actually not trying to align with these bottom-up groups that wanted to resist uh, the existing hegemony, but much more they tried to work around it, uh, as we will see. So these are three positions in thinking about contemporary art that you'll see in the biennials as well. So let's let's look at these biennials. First of all, the Bangkok Art Biennale or the PAB. Um, this but the, the core person in this biennial is th this this dude here, Apinan Prashananda, uh, who was a very well known or respected uh, Thai artist and then curator who stayed a long time in New York, had his education there, and he organized uh, two exhibitions in the late in the late nineteen eighties. That, that attracted a lot of attention and, and that were very well received within the art world as well. So he, he's a legitimate artist, which had a, a very good position also as a curator. Later, he became a civil servant, uh, which in the Thai setting also meant that his, his allegiances changed a lot. Uh, for years, he worked uh, in, in the Ministry of Culture, and in the end, he became the director of a new Office for Contemporary Art and Culture. And at that office, for quite some time, he tried to organize a biennial because he felt Thailand needs to have a biennial. However, within the bureaucratic set, setting, that proved almost impossible. After that, he was hired by Thai Bep, uh, a huge drinks company. Uh, they sell a lot of water, they sell chung beer, uh, but also they have a lot of real estate positions in, in Bangkok, uh, a huge company. And, and for that company, he is organizing now the Thailand Biennale. So, here, this is a picture where he announces the, the, the Bangkok Art Biennale, right? Well, here he's standing in Ferrex, Venice, obviously, and it's not for nothing that he announced the Bangkok Art Biennale in Venice because he wanted to image the Bangkok Art Biennale like the Venice Biennale, uh, which in itself is an, is an example of, uh, of effective power. Um, it's not for nothing then that when, when these posters come out of the Bangkok Art Biennale, they stress the river a lot on a par with, with the canals in Venice. And they've been very deliberately thinking about that. So what was, uh, what happened there? According to Apinan, Bangkok has been waiting for a long time on this biennial. So furthermore, uh, he said that the Bangkok Art Biennale 2018 will mark Bangkok as one of the world cities of art and culture, enhancing the experience of cultural tourism in Thailand for a world to witness, as well as increasing the number of high quality tourists and travelers. We believe that it will not only encourage tourism and positively impact our economy, but will lead to benefits the quality of life of Thai people in terms of commerce and services. Of course, this was the sales pitch, but it had a strong focus on attracting tourism. Now, one of the things that you need to remember because of his history, Apinan brought together very good contacts within the civil service, which was very crucial if you wanted to organize a big event in Thailand or in Bangkok. And, and these sort of quotes obviously partly targeted those civil servants because it shows why it's important to have this and it sounds nice as a civil servant, right? On the other hand, he brought together this network of civil servants with this corporate power and with this very extensive Rolodex of contacts in the art world that he had developed before. So as a person, he brought together three crucial groups of people. Now that, that resulted in an actually organized biennial with 20 locations, which, which in Thailand really is no mean feat to, to get that organized, uh, given how difficult organizing in Thailand can be, is, is quite impressive. And if you look at the locations themselves, so in the map of the locations, the river is very present. And then you'll see that, that, that this is a mixture of temples, uh, shopping malls, uh, and a couple of dedicated spaces. And these dedicated spaces are all re real estate holdings of Thai Bef, right? The shopping malls are not owned by Thai Bef, but they are by friends of the Thai Bef network. And uh, the, uh, the temples, our temples were tied back for, for a long time already has been investing money to support uh, their functioning. So each of these spaces had an, an established existing relationship with Tibet. Now at these various locations, 
uh, the, the Bangkok uh, Biennale showed a lot of works. And, and thus, in, in newspapers, it said Bangkok is turning into a giant art gallery. So there was art in temples. Uh, this is Temple of the Iron Fence. Uh, this is a work there um, uh, where, where the existing space of the temple was used for a new artwork. Uh, there was art in shopping malls. Um, and uh, th this is uh, Choi Young Hwa in, in the mall, the M Quartier. Uh, so these were a lot of these sort of spectacular works, uh, very easy to the eye, exciting. Um, there were also works in, in some cultural spaces. This is the B BACC, the Bank of Art, Cultures and Art. Uh, and culture center. Now, these types of, of display of art very much focused on, on excitement and experience. So it was an endless opportunity for Instagram, of course. So here you see people taking uh, pictures in, in front of this work in the BACC. Uh, here are people taking pictures in uh, what I run. Uh, this is uh, Lara actually taking a picture in Temple of Iron Fence, so this is a, a bit biased maybe as a picture. Uh, but here are, are people that we don't know taking pictures in uh, Siam Paragon, one of the really big shopping malls. And, and Yayoi Kasama, uh, which is very well known around the world, of course, makes these type of works that, that work really well to, to exhibit this exciting setting, right? And she also is in a lot of advertisement campaigns, for instance, of Louis Vuitton, that then ties in again with consumerism. So that's, that's one side of what this biennial was. Another side of what this biennial was, was the relationship of art with real estate. Now here on the background, on the left, you see One Bangkok, which is the name of a huge project, not surprisingly, by Tibet or by the real estate companies of Tibet. So if you look uh, here at the back, you see this, uh, this black uh, box here, it's called the BAB box. And, and at that box, you see three things coming together. First of all, uh, artwork by South Korean artist uh, Cho Young Hwa. And this again is, is, is a very spectacular work. This work works with uh, inflatable and, and, and it inflates and then it deflates again. So that these leaves are sort of these petals are, are wet going up and down, uh, which, which from a point of view of spectacle works really well. Secondly, what comes together here is, is the art event itself, the Bangkok Art Biennale. And then thirdly, what comes together here is the real estate project, One Bangkok. It's not for nothing that that uh, BAB box, which is the central exhibition space of the Bangkok Art Biennale, is next to One Bangkok, the biggest project in Bangkok at the moment. And actually, this space, the BAB box, would then transform into the sales office of the One Bangkok project. So One Bangkok, would build all these these fake houses inside where you could go into the house that you could buy as a sales office so directly the, the status and and of of, contem of contemporary art is being transferred onto this project well that's at least the idea so one bangkok itself is presented as a, a fully integrated district and and uh, that actually also sort of resembles what the bangkok art biennale itself is it's a fully integrated uh, uh, art biennial this on the background is the plot of the Agon Bangkok project. It's really huge. Um, and, and, and it's going to take, uh, I think, 15 years to complete. And there will be new art spaces uh, organized within that project as well to, to link up the status of the Bangkok Art Biennale with uh, this project. Another example is the East Asiatic building. This is, this is a building from uh, the end of the 19th century. Uh, when, when English traders were, were settling in, uh, in, in Bangkok and uh, it, it, it has been dilapidated for, for uh, years and years and years, but now it's being bought up by Thai Bev and they're going to make a hotel of it. This is on the site where on the top floors they haven't done anything, but on the downstairs already, you can see that it will be a Plaza Atini hotel. So again, by making this building part of the Bangkok Art Biennale, they transfer the value of art on the building. It's, it's a way of adding value to a building. So this is a typical example of what, what Botansky to the right and Esquerre to the left called enrichment. And what I mean is not enrichment of people, but enrichment of objects. Real estate in itself can just be a house or just be a, a shopping mall, but you can add value to that by making, giving it status. And contemporary art can use a fantastic role to do that. So this is the idea here. 
Now that reflects also in the sponsors of the Biennale, which is quite a big list, including uh, all the locations, but it also includes tourism and, and real estate companies. So above all, then the idea here, and this reminds us of a quote of David Harvey, the city has to appear as an innovative, exciting, creative and safe place to live or to visit, to play and to consume in. That's true, but at the same time, it needs to do more. It needs to entice us to consume. It needs us to want to consume and it needs us to want to live in those buildings of one bank or it needs us to want to visit the new hotel of Plaza Athene. So it's, it's, it's an attempt to make us wish things that we didn't even know we wanted. Now, one thing in this whole story, which I think is quite crucial, is that doesn't mean that there is no critical art in this exhibition. So actually, there are various artists presented at this biennial that are well known as critical artists, that, that, that are criticizing the regime, uh, that, that are presenting other ways of thinking about Thailand. So, but the, the crucial thing is criticality itself here has become a resource. And this is one of the points that Han also makes about uh, opposition under uh, neoliberal power. Um, being critical as such doesn't become a problem because it's being controlled. Now, how does that work? First of all, Apinan himself really presents this biennial as a risky event. So first of all, that comes forward in the title, Beyond Bliss, um, and, and then later titles also, explicitly tie into, on the one hand, the idea of Thai bliss, but on the other side, also, well, it, it questions, is Thailand really bliss? Which is a very, this was organized four years after the most recent uh, coup d'etat, when there was still not uh, um, a democratically, uh, even if as far as that possible, uh, an elected prime minister. So at that time, a lot of people in Thailand were not that bliss at all. But actually, Apinan explicitly asked that question, which is, is striking given that he doesn't really want to um, anger the existing regime that much. But this is hard to read again. Nice. So, uh, but what he says himself, and, and this is when he was, uh, was talking to the media, he organized a whole international media tour, as you do, of course, when you organize these things. And he said, we have taken risks with the biennial, bi biennial but I've been in so much trouble in the past, so risk taking is part of the excitement. He really presents himself as a risk taker, even though he's the most safe person in a civil, system, civil servant position, uh, formerly now working for, for very much money for a big corporate corporation. And then he joked also sitting on his wall, and this was, was told, this, this was recounted in one of the articles, uh, when their boat was passing, when he was talking to the press, and he said like, Oh, that must be the military. I'm being censored now. He really made a joke about the fact that he, and, and this all tied in with his, he was really messaging, we're risky. Look, we've got these critical artists. So, and that was actually also uh, lapped up by, by the international press, which was quite irritating, actually. So, according to CNN, uh, Bangkok's In Art Europe Biennale showcases challenging Thai art. Uh, according to The Guardian, risk taking artists defy Thai taboos at Bangkok Art Biennale. So, they all actually copied what he'd been saying. Now, uh, how was that possible, given that he wants to entice us to things, and, but he at the same time doesn't really want to oppose uh, the regime too much. Well, the way in which this worked was what we call a strategy of total curation. Through choices that were made in the curatorial process, there was a lot of control over what these critical works actually could do. And here you really see the smoothness and the expertness of Apinan coming forward in the way that he organized this biennial. So first of all, many of the selected artists were personal contacts. So he, know, he knew, and there were artists actually that were in his debt. So, and the same actually went for selected co-curators that were very well-known international co-curators. But when we interviewed them and we said we were a little bit surprised about the lack of critical engagement, they said, well, yeah, this is based on all debt. We, we, uh, I'll use my next show for something legitimate. They were literal about that, right? So through personal control, he knew how to control what happened there. Secondly, he also, he didn't allow international curators to curate the Thai artists. So all the Thai artists were curated by himself, which of course would be the most problematic. It doesn't matter for Apinan if there's critical art about the world outside of Thailand. The only thing that he would be worried about is criti criticism of the military or criticism of, of the monarchy. That would be his big, biggest problem, obviously. 
Now, another thing that's very remarkable, there were hardly any curatorial statements. There was hardly any background information on the artworks. Um, there was no public engagement program or, or, or a talk. So the artworks and the way that contemporary art works is you have the artwork, but then the artwork has meaning in a context. If that context is not presented, it's actually just an object and, and its critical function falls away. A good example would be the work of Jakai, who is uh, a Thai artist who, who organizes a lot of uh, community projects. From, and one of the organizers that was displayed here was about Burmese immigrants. And he had Burmese immigrants broider uh, flags. And, and it was a very stark criticism of the role of nations in the control over people. And, and even Jakai said that he was really worried at the opening when his work was displayed at the BACC that he would have to shake hands with uh, the ambassador of uh, Burma because the work was so critical of Burma and Thailand. Uh, and, and clearly, if you would show that work and really give it to podium and discuss it, that, that, that is a critical work. But the way that it was displayed just showed beautiful flags where people were taking selfies in front of the flag and any sort of critical potential of that work would disappear. And people really would, would have to go through the effort themselves of looking it up, which in under neoliberal capitalism doesn't work a lot, doesn't happen a lot. So this is another way of what we call total curation, where you have total control by the way of presenting works of what function they will start to fulfill. So in the end, risks within this biennial that might have been there couldn't actually be a danger for commitments to hegemony. Uh, this was also became very clear if you would look at the opening events, which were all held, uh, yeah, which were all held uh, in in uh, in venues linked to 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 hegemonic partners. There was one in the navy yard. Uh, this one is in Long Ninety Nine, which is owned by a very old Chinese family. Uh, they were all uh, parties part of the existing hegemony where all these events were organized. So the allegiances were very clear. The allegiance was with actually the existing hegemony, but the aim was not to strengthen the hegemony. The aim was to strengthen consumerism on the one hand and real estate values on the other. So the BAB itself is really the idea of psychopolitics at work. This is the, a clear example of how psychopolitics, according to John Cho Han, works. The two other uh, 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 biennials, I'm, I'm discussing much shorter. This I saw Mark's note, I have to finish up. The, the Thailand Biennale uh, is uh, a biennale organized by the Thai state, by the OCAC, the Office for Contemporary Art and Culture. Um, when we were doing the research for that, we talked to friends and one of them said, are you researching the Thailand Biennale? Ouch. A friend of mine does some design work for them. The bureaucracy is a drama. This was the overall feeling of everybody in Thailand. The, the Thai state cannot do anything well. It will be a drama and nobody did expect anything of it. The surprise was that in the end, if you would visit the Thailand Biennale, it was actually quite nice. Partly that was because it was in Krabi, uh, where the natural environment was just really beautiful and you would just go to Krabi and the people that went there the formal uh, critics, they were taken on a tour, which was nice because they were brought everywhere. But of course, if you went yourself, you had to, had to go there yourself, which was highly problematic because the Thai state had forgotten to fix transportation and the local boat and taxi mafia earned so much money, it's not funny anymore. But, but in itself, the works were really nice and it looks really well. Uh, these are some examples of, of works that were there. This is a funny work because it's next to this uh, pier that people didn't want. Uh, these are two works in itself going to those places experiencing them there was was decent background information on the works through uh, that which actually works very well so surprisingly the biennial was nice however there were also really weird things like this work was being displayed also by a national artist which didn't seem to have any place in the whole biennial it didn't make any sense given the, the curatorial statement or anything so what happened here is that it was organized by the OCC, as I said, and they actually perceived it as an art Olympics. The, 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 the Thai state cannot imagine of art other than as a competition. Um, in the end, they, they decided to make it a two year instead of four year event. And the aim, the clear aim was to stimulate the regional economy, which fits with Jung Chol Han's idea of psychopolitics, where you use an art event to, to strengthen the economy. Um, they made steps that also fit that they hired an international curator and a team 
and and they these make plans according to the rules of the international art world and these were legitimate ideas uh including an enormous engagement program that they wanted to organize so there were some 50 such specific works which is quite a lot and these works they engaged with people that were living in those areas so there were artists uh getting living two months with a, with a village where the villagers were interacting with the artists they were all pretty well thought out uh, ideas and very prometically these were to be presented outdoors in the national park and to, to present an art world out, outdoors just brings a lot of problems for instance because there's no control there can be vandalism there can be all sorts of ideas right so however during the curatorial process there were growing problems why well, the state or the OCAC got really worried about what this curator wanted to do, and especially about the, the artists that they had invited, which were very critical artists, and the sort of engagement program that they wanted to do. And they started to censor artists. They started to push back. They, uh, in the end, the plans for the public engagement were not uh, done anymore. So there was this, this continuous struggle between the artists, uh, sorry, between the curatorial team and the OCAC, and the OCC was, was restricting or restricting further. So in the end, another big problem was that there was no clarity about money in this first place because the state wanted to control that. And secondly, there was no money for upkeep, which became quite dramatic to when a big typhoon went over and destroyed almost all the works. In the end, and also the opening event was organized without the curatorial team present, which is a clear sign that things went wrong. So these, this, this, in the end, the opening event was this, this rather weird event that showcased the different people of Thailand, uh, very different from what an international curator would have organized for sure. Uh, and, and the end, again, was sort of a flag bearing mission where uh, the prime minister of Thailand handed over the flag to, or, or the, the military leader of Thailand handed over the flag to a governor of Korab, the next organizers, all not really befitting an international art biennial. So in the end, then, if you look at th th uh, the Thailand Biennale, this is still sort of an attempt for psychopolitics, but then it meets the restrictive state that wants to push back against this. Very short, the last biennial, the Bangkok Biennial. This really is an anonymous organized event, bottom-up organized by artists without a central curator. Uh, there were 75 pavilions, but these pavilions were basically anything that people said they wanted to do. You could just register on an online forum, say what you were doing. They could be online or in real time. They could be one day or three months. They could be in Bangkok or outside of Bangkok. All the choices were made by the pavilion organizers, which meant there was no central control over what, what the message in these pavilions could be. So in the end, there were pavilions in uh, Bangkok, Patani, Konken, Japan, the Netherlands. These pavilions were bottom up and they challenged the, uh, the authority of access. So this is the, there was a guide for pavilions. This is what you could read on, online for if you wanted to organize this pavilion. And it, it said it's, it, it, it's meant to level the playing field for contemporary art organizing. This biennial is set up as a challenge to the authority of access to representation in art and curatorial practices, exactly against the art of the state that we just looked at. Um, this is a page from, from the title pavilions. In the end, then, there were all sorts of pavilions. This was, I'll just discuss one. This was a pavilion by, by students who found an empty space in the building where they were li living. And they started to display all sorts of things. And their, their pavilion was actually to talk with their neighbors about what is art. Very small scale. Uh, it doesn't change Bangkok in any way, in any large sense, but a, a micro practice that could be very, very meaningful for people in that building. It's just one example. Um, so if the exhibition of the artworks, and this is, this is the interpretation of David Tay of this biennial, if the exhibition of artworks was the pretext for this encounter, it was not necessarily the main point. So the exhibition of the artworks was not what it was about. It was about the encounter between people and what happened then. So this biennial, instead of using psychopolitics, actually resisted the whole idea of the good life and of psychopolitics and instead try to support forms of socializing that are exactly pushed away by these new forms of control of neoliberal capitalism. Okay, towards interpretation, and this is my last slide, and this is where it's very short. So it is very clear that there's different regimes in organizing these biennials, and also that thereby they, they result in different types of, of, of exhibitions, but also in different types of functions. 
these these regimes of organizing relate to different worlds in the Thai art world that are also really literally very separate. So people that organize the Banco Biennial will hardly talk with people that organize the Thailand Biennale and so on. It's very separate, in very separate circles. So um, what is clear is that the state has always used art from the start for its effective qualities to shape ideas about Thainess in a positive way. So that idea of Tun Chal Han already worked since the 1930s in Thailand. However, to, uh, that idea runs into trouble as contemporary art world doesn't want to play that game. And internally, uh, this approach by the state is being overtaken by these smooth ma managers, for instance, of the Bank of Art Biennale that are much better at that game, but don't want to imagine a new Thailand, they want to imagine new consumption. But those smooth managers aim to use effect for consumerism and enrichment but without changing the existing hegemony. And then there's this third scene of these bottom-up organizers. And it's really questionable, and it's an open question, if those can actually make a difference in, in a city like Bangkok. Okay, apologies for being a bit long, but that was it. Thank you very much. We have about uh, half an hour of time for questions, also uh, for those online, if they have uh, comments. I guess the online people will just type in. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I'm so interested in arts and here in Hong Kong, I can relate it. Like uh, for you, like the AV, seems to me like a lot of yeah. uh, For that case, I deny uh, itself like the uh, convention center. This EV, like itself, like um, smaller, yeah. like, decentralized. Yeah. So, my very question is you mentioned about. Uh, hegemony, counter hegemony. Here in Hong Kong, like, unfortunately, for some kind of counter hegemony, like, kind of deep persons like art clubs, they try to take them on the new way or whatever. It's generally co opted by this kind of thing. Go to KL and then you go and find an NFT. And how about those in Thailand that you explore? challenge the economic dominance. Okay, thank you. So first of all, your observation that these, these basic ways of engaging with art or, or basic ideas about how art functions, that they are, you can see them in, in Hong Kong also. I would totally agree with you. Um, the question, however, is how are they different also? And I think that's where issues of structure become very important. Yes, there are people here in Hong Kong that have been doing beautiful work, organizing from the bottom up, uh, doing things together. However, there's hardly any space for them. And there is hardly any time for them to work because if you actually commit your life to that, if you know from the start that life will be just maturely very difficult, right? In Bangkok, things in that sense are very different. You could say Bangkok so far is still less neoliberal in the way that the economy functions. So uh, most of our Thai friends that, that work in that sort of commons oriented art organizing, they have a job, they work three days a week, something like that, but working three days a week is enough to maintain yourself. Very often they live with their parents, but the parents very often also have larger plots where there's maybe an extra house. Um, so, so there is also the way that society there work, it is possible to actually maintain quite a lot of time to do your organizing, to put your energy in. Whereas we all know that here in Hong Kong, you just really need to have a full-time job to not have enough money to do anything, right? So all that extra time, you really, all the mechanisms that Byung Chul Han mentions, obviously you want to start to earn more, so you go invest in yourself. So structurally, the reason why in Thailand it's more relaxed to focus on other, other things it, it, is, it, it has to do with economic structure, I think. Um, another thing then is that, that once you want to do something, it's much easier to find space for that. I mean, the, the, the space that we're just opening now, the whole building, which is a shop house, costs 60,000 baht, which is about $4,100. Now, of course, income is much lower in Bangkok, but still, for, uh, that amount of money is very achievable if you share it with five people. It's, it's like a thousand Hong Kong. So if you run your space, you can just do it in one of those places. You can run that in those couple of days. So it is understandable that that bottom-up organizing exists. How then does that 
play back into the art that's being produced. So for instance, the discussion about NFT. That's a really interesting one that in Hong Kong, the whole discussion about NFT is totally hijacked by the crypto bros and, and by people that want to make money and, and the, 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 the gallery owners and, and all the, especially art advisors, which is a huge world here, that, that those people that try to make money by advising rich people what they should buy uh, and having the context to the artist to get that work, uh, get a hold of that work at least. That, so it's, it's very much a commercial financial discussion. The funny thing is that in Thailand, there is a huge optimism that, that the whole crypto and NFT technology can be uh, a counter to the state because it partly uh, links in with a control, a, 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 a controlling of space where you can choose who you need and who not. And it's much harder to surveil those spaces. So in Thailand, actually, yes, there's a lot of potential for NFTs and there's a lot of NFT makers, but these especially come from the world of protesters. Uh, it's a lot of protest art, it's a lot of protest art, and it actually funds a lot of counter hegemonic activity. So very different from here. But I think the reason for that is it's mainly structural. So, so directly, the, the last the last coup was in 2014, and directly thereafter, um, the state has been exceptionally repressive. Uh, a lot of people that were very outspoken before just directly became quiet, and we all know that that directly links into visit they got from secret police, uh, threats to families, all these sort of things. Otherwise, they wouldn't remain quiet. So the control by the state has been strong. Also, initially. There has been a pushback by the state and in the military uh, of contemporary art. So there were military visited some art spaces. It had a presence, and also in the first first months, the first year after 2014, there was an exodus exodus of artists and art organizers from Bangkok to Chiang Mai because Chiang Mai was further away from the central control. Uh, however, long term, that has not really been the case, and and already now. Uh, there are a lot of things happening in art spaces that are very clearly counter uh, hegemonic, uh, explicitly so. And there is no pushback from the state. Everybody is obviously still, uh, if you would make drawings that are critical of the monarchy, you're aware of that. But also that has been happening a lot in protest art uh, without a lot of consequences. So only in situations where artists were very actively politically organizing, has there been a very continued uh, repression. So friends of us are now in exile in, in Portugal because there were co-organizers of groups that supported the protests two, three years ago. That, that does exist. But that was more because of their political organizing activities than, than of their art activities as such. So the interesting thing, and I think that's one of the things in which Thailand is different than, than, than here in Hong Kong, uh, is, is that there is in a funny way, although it's extremely restrictive, a certain space that you can exploit to do things. And, and, and our, our friends especially say that the Thai state is just too silly or too stupid to understand the work, the, the way that contemporary art works. That's the first way. They just don't realize that contemporary art can be powerful. And secondly, in Thailand, because the, the narrative about art has been so pushed by the state, art has this referred position where the police cannot imagine that art is bad as such because it has always been pushed as something good. Uh, so that is in a funny way that also protects uh, critical artists uh, from prosecution. And, and actually now that they are being uh, artists that are being uh, slapped with, with court cases, they very systematically say we are an artist and art is there, it needs free space and this is how art functions and it's different from the normal world so you can't and that's actually an argument that the police list and the, and, and, uh, the in legal cases also that's been listened to. Well, I'm just, I want to put up on that point a bit. Uh, 
Uh, what interests me, or what, what, what occurred to me listening to your talk is how much the Thai case uh, deviated from, you know, some of the ideas that you were talking about with Kong and others. Because really the, the capitalism, the consumerism story is only one part of the Thai story. It's, as you say, critical art, uh, censorship, but it's also the idea of art as part of national identity building. And going back to the you know, tradition of the art school and so on, it's also kind of interesting that that early period is influenced by Italian fascism, very specific in terms of the first director of the art school, in terms of that. So there, there is the national slash fascist period, depending on how one wants to interpret that. So it seems to me that that whole, whole part of the story kind of falls out of your analytical framework. And I'm wondering how you, you know, because, you know, you're obviously pushing us, interpretation, keep asking the question, how does this relate to consumerism and so on? But it seems like equally important in your story is how does this relate to, to, to national yeah. identity? Yeah. And how does this relate to criticism of formations of finance, which, or, or understandings of finance, which are, of course, under again, power configurations. Yeah. So that makes the, the Thai story very distinctive from a classic sort of capitalist New York kind of story, right? I mean, yeah. Presumably New York art would be very classic, although you do have those who are obviously challenging that, trying to challenge that hegemony. It's, it's a consumer, consumerist capitalist versus that. Whereas the Thai story is very different because of this national dimension slash uh, criticism of the state. Yeah, no, I, I would totally agree with you. That's, I, I, I think, also due to the fact that the DAB discussion was longer mm -hmm. so in the Thailand biennial discussion, ex, especially the, the pushback of the state in that case is because of nation building and ideas of ident national identity related to nation building. Um, so I, I would totally agree with you. And the only thing I think that is a thing that traditionally almost in every country art is also done. Uh, there are very good analysis of how the CIA, CIA used uh, abstract expressionism mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the Cold War. There is very good analysis of how Japan used uh, uh, art, Japanese art forms. Uh, so these, and, and uh, this is a recurrent thing, how actually national identity formation is tied in with, uh, with, with art, modern art, earlier art in, in the Netherlands. Uh, the, this idea of the golden age, which is the most painful part of the Dutch history, but which is consistently framed as our, our fantastic moment where the Netherlands was the biggest colonizer of the world. Uh, and Dutch people still do not want to critically engage with that because, no, this is where our golden age was with our beautiful paintings. So historically, this, I think, is in many countries how, how art has functioned. I would totally agree with you. In, in Hong Kong, you have the same, there has been the same attempt where, um, uh, where modern ink, ink art, of course, being the prime Chinese uh, art form, uh, also from a point of view of national identity. But Hong Kong was this place where modern ink art could develop because ink art by that time was being forbidden by the Communist Party in China. So all the people that flew from, uh, from China, the artists, either went to Taiwan or to Hong Kong, but Hong Kong really became the, at the center the epicenter of, of modern uh, modern ink art, and uh, these are works that that the museum here has collected vigorously. Uh, so so they have tried, and especially the British government has tried. It was a fantastic example for the British government because it was at the same time very Chinese, but at the same time also very anti-communist. So they have been very actively using this the Brits as as sort of a national as sort of a local identity for Hong Kong versus China, but to also make it, get, get, make it very local. So I think these processes you see in many places, and you're totally right, that that is a crucial element in understanding anything related to art in, 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 uh, in Thailand. And, and that is really centered in this opposition within the Thailand Biennale. So out of genuine ignorance, is there an interesting theoretical tradition that takes that on, that, that tries to understand? But when you talk about the dilemmas artists face because of this one. No, not that. Not really. There, there are some separate books, but not really. No. So that is one of the he mentioned writing projects. That's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
the local uh, office are more interested in the digital world. So maybe you may this the fact that they are kind of um, colonial. Vice chains to be dealt with the local one. Yeah. And yet, this, this relation between the local and the international is, is a hugely important theme uh, in, in everywhere, also here in Hong Kong, and, and that gets a lot of attention of how that develops. Uh, in Thailand, it has a very specific connotation because being accepted in the world is, is seen as the utmost applause that you can get in Thailand almost, which is, seems maybe weird, which is, to be an internationally recognized artist is really important in Thailand. And artists that either are also really presented as examples to Thailand. But the funny thing is, while they're being used in such a sense, they're only used for domestic reasons. So, for instance, if you see at the the the, the contributions that uh, the Thai government or the OCAC who organizes this delivers at the Venice Biennale, from an international point of view, they are really atrocious. But honestly, they, they just don't make any sense. But it doesn't matter because they were in Venice Biennale, they participated. So the, the whole conversation in that sense is about what does it do domestically, where it's not really an eagerness to internationally do something. When you look at the discussion in the Thai state, there is another issue, however, with post-colonialism. And that's where it turns around because by a lot of the, the power leaders, the post-colonial argument is used actually pushed back against international criticism. You see the same thing uh, happening also uh, in China, where actually uh, Apinan is very good at this, where he said, well, it, there's been a lot of criticism on the fact that he didn't have, he didn't support critical discussion. And then he said, yeah, you're, you're just these, these Westerners talking about our, our, our place, but you don't understand how it works in Thailand. And he actually used this argument of post-colonialism as well as still wanted to interfere with, with the Thai country. Whereas what he wanted to do clearly was, was supporting uh, things not changing at least. And you see this thing in many places with authoritarian regimes happening. Uh, so I want to ask you Those in Chiang Mai that are known for you know, excellence, yeah. you know, places for I've seen them. So, yeah, I, I don't think that's, that's a very easy answer to that. And I also think that really changes over time, all the time. So, Chiang Mai University was one of the first really good art schools outside of Bangkok. And, and at that time, Bangkok mainly had so called university. So, Chiang Mai was really the center of counter hegemonic art in a way because that supported this, this different way of thinking. So in that sense, Chiang Mai was known for some, to be much more interesting from the point of view of art than Bangkok was actually. However, by now there's so many educations in Bangkok, Bangkok is much bigger, so there's much more. But there's, uh, the, the, there are things happening in Chiang Mai that are not happening as much in uh, Bangkok, but it changed. So for instance, there is a really good museum in Chiang Mai but then, the, 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 which is a private museum, but then the, the owner of that museum now also opened an art space in Bangkok again. So it's it's going up and down all the time a little bit. And I think the, the, the main difference is Bangkok is much bigger and there is so much communication over up and down that from a point of view of socialization, there is not that big a difference because all these Chiang Mai artists are in Bangkok all the time and not the way around. <laughs> Bit of a clarification question. I was interested in something you said with the image where you were describing this uh, uh, now in, uh, uh, in Germany. You said there was this kind of conflict that you don't believe war. Yes. Can you say a bit more about that? Yes, what of course. Was the conflict about and why did yeah. you were left with this? So, what happened is Ron Krupa were, were the curators of, of that specific biennial and they had been active in, in various Western places already previously, as, as is normal, because the, Documenta is the biggest event being, being, being the, the curator is a huge thing, right? 
it's 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 Kassel is a very small town and it's got ridiculous amounts of money to organize this art show, right? And in, in, in the international art world, it's it's seen as having more quality and more, being more important for the development of, of both the artists and, and curatorship than the Venice Biennale. Um, Rome Grupa had been invited and 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 the, the, the Biennale board thought that that was a very good idea. They were also proud of themselves to uh, allowing this podium for a, 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 a curatorial team who came from Indonesia. So they really, so they invited the periphery to, to really have the position. Now, of course, it's very easy at first to be really happy with that, but of course, you do, the proof of the pudding isn't eating, right? So what happened is Rome Grupa are not a traditional, Top down, a, a, a traditional curator is the person that knows everything and he'll organize that. He has a statement, he organizes everything. That's, it's very black and white what I'm saying now, but that's traditional how people thought about curatorship. Room group is a collective. So what they do is they do stuff together and they believe very strongly that, uh, that there should not be central control over what happens in places. That actually collective organizing is a good way to resist all forms of domination or a lot of forms of domination. And they do that in their personal practice. They do that in whatever they organize with others as well. So what did Rome Grupa do? They use that as the model for the whole biennial. So they, instead of, they, they didn't invite artists, they invited about 10 teams. I'm not sure about the exact number. And they gave those 10, they divided the overall budget that they had in 10. And they gave everything, everybody just the 10 of the budget and said, you do with that what you want to do. And those invited people again spread it so there was no control hardly any control over it which which then of course can result means that whatever can be presented now what happened then is that some of the works that were another thing is that the, the collective that they invited were all very much counter hegemonic in their own settings right and were and, and the, the pervading feeling of anybody involved with organizing in the whole biennial was that the world is an outrageously unfair world and that, that the center of that unfairness is the Western world and that the Western world is ridiculously hypocrite because they are very sensitive to certain forms of, of, of inequality and others they just don't mind at all. And a case in point is also that a Palestinian collective was invited and the argument was that, well, how can you on the one hand be quiet about the Israeli state, and on the other hand, be, be so critical of, of Palestine, Palestine and, and forget about the whole story of Palestine in a fair way. That became the whole painful point in, in this whole controversy. That turned out to be one word by Tani Pali, a collective from Indonesia also, that had clear Jewish stereotypes. But by the way, it had stereotypes of a lot of different groups from around the world. But of course, showing a Jewish stereotype was a bit sensitive in Germany and and that became and they were already before that they were criticized for being uh, uh, anti-semitist but the most painful thing is that is that the whole press directly jumped on that and didn't do any reasonable work and just reinforced all those things so from the point of view of the organizers this was a clear example of how western domination functions and and they didn't easily want to give in and and that became the whole so from from the from the the and, and then one of the organizers of Rome Grupo was had to come to uh, the Reichstag to explain what they were doing. This became and and what what actually the Rome Grupo wanted to do is uh, they wanted to have an open discussion where they invited all sorts of people, including Palestinians. That was not allowed by the biennial organizers because, of course, we can't invite uh, Palestinian speakers and these sort of things. So. In all the responses, actually, the points that the organizers and, and all the other, this, this network of organizers were making, were actually being reinforced. There have been, after that, uh, quite a lot of molestation of people organizing uh, uh, pavilions. There was one LGBTQ pavilion where uh, 10 people that were present were, were uh, horrendously harassed. Uh, the behavioral the, the organizers, uh, the, the, the board, has said, hasn't said anything about it. The, the, the German politics haven't said anything about it. There is repeated examples of, of racial, racialized responses to organizers and to people involved with the biennial that nobody has responded to. So the overall thing, and still, if you now read recensions of what happened, the point of the anti-Semitism is explained 
in every detail, but the counterpoint is just only making out, well, they also said that they were harassed. There is no fair representation of those points. So everybody, everybody felt, and we arrived when, when just two days after that huge work had to be taken away. And I mean, we were talking with one, one of the guys that was there, he, he organizes what's called the Aborigine uh, Embassy. He's traveling the world. Uh, he's from Aborigine descent, and he's for 20 years already. He is saying that it's ridiculous that uh, Aborigine people don't have a representation and so on. And he has that, and he was so explicitly about this has a lot to do uh, with anti is it uh, Rome Rupa being from Indonesia, which is uh, an Islam country. So all these things that were tied in gave, gave all these people that would organize the feeling that obviously there, there was no fairness and this was exactly showing what's wrong about the world so i also think that actually in the end the organized are not too unhappy about what happened i think they they got their point across i only think that both germany europe and and the art world need 10 to 15 years to honestly look at that but that's that's a very personal opinion about this thing of course Apart from the fact that also the, or there were works that just shouldn't have been part of, of the show, there can also be. Yeah. So, if there are no further questions, and there are no questions online, I guess. Okay, then uh, all that remains is to say thank you very much.